Thank you for joining our broadcast today at City Life Church. We would love to hear how God is using this ministry to change your life. So please take a moment to send us your story at info at citylifechurch.cc. And if God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, we want to encourage you to partner with us financially to help us to bring God's word to other people. You can go to our website at citylifechurch.cc to find the giving options that work best for you. We've got an encouraging word for you, and we pray that you lean in and engage as we head into the auditorium for today's message. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. We're starting a new series today called We Are the City. We are the city. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. The Lord said to me, I have a greater task for you, my servant. Not only will you restore to greatness the people of Israel who have survived, but I will also make you a light to the nations so that all the world might be saved. I will make you a light to the nations. Jesus is talking in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, and he says this. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, we begin to talk during quarantine and you know when you when you are in isolation it gives you a lot of time to think anybody had time to think maybe in this separated time or you know I haven't traveled like I normally do we've we've been at home a lot and things slowly kind of started getting back to normal and so we just began to talk about the church and me and Casey began to talk about the what ifs and what the new season would look like and we saw transition in, in some places and you know we came back and I met our ad list and we began to meet with staff and said we're not going to do this anymore we are going to do this we're going to this out. We're going to add this. We just begin to talk about this next season because we begin to think about where we were, where we were at now, and where we were going. And we begin to talk about the fabric of who we are as the people of God. You know, I've never been in a season like this. This has been the, really the most difficult season of pastoring that I've ever had to walk through. I asked my dad, pastor over 40 years. I asked Pastor Jesus, which is our Spanish pastor, been in ministry over 50 years. I said, have you ever seen a season like this? I've talked to pastor friends. Not only is there a pandemic, but we have this racial tension in our nation. We have this election that is polarizing and dividing people. You can't, you know, find the right channel to watch because they all have different opinions. And I've never walked in a season or seen a time where we feel like the nation is more divided. But the truth of the matter is, in a divided time like this, the church needs to be unified like never before. We need the people of God to have one voice, a voice of clarity, to stand for righteousness. And as we walk in this season, we begin to really sense God taking us back to some things that were the fabric of how we started. 13 years ago, we began this journey together and we started in another building we had on the interstate and we sold that building, we acquired this building, then we acquired our East Lake campus and it's been such a cool journey. But when we started this journey, we really felt like God had called us to be a life-giving church to the city. We're a city church. We're not a suburban church. Now, people come from the suburb, but we're in the heart of the city. Look around you every week, over 40 nationalities, 50 nationalities. They pile in a building and they meet. And now we have people spread out online and we're slowly coming back together. But every week, we're a mosaic of the kingdom. We are a mosaic of people. We are a mosaic of the kingdom of God. And I began to read through the word of God and I found this word city and I went to the Bible dictionary and I went to my concordance and I began to find out what this word city actually meant. And it said this. A settled group of people living in permanent dwellings and bound together by political, economic, ethnicity, and family ties. A group of people, a mosaic of people that have now begun to live together in permanent structures. Because you have to understand in this time, there were many temporal settings and towns and villages that were made of tents and people would kind of just journey and they'd find a spot and they would just kind of settle and start building. But a city in this day, there were very few cities in this day, they were beacons of influence. And people from villages and towns would come to cities for resources, for government. It would be the seat of authority where things were established and decreed. It would be the place of worship where people would come from areas 
uh, surrounding and they would come with their family for seasons of worship. And we find that these cities like Jerusalem and Rome, they had great influence. And they influenced the culture of the day. And Jesus is talking here and he says, you are a city set up on a hill to be a light. Do not hide it under a bushel, but put it high up on a lampstand so that those around you might see the good works in you. Now we know this. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. You can't do enough to earn your salvation. You can't get enough marks on the board to get to a higher level of Christianity. You're saved by grace. We work by grace and through grace. But what you have to understand is there is something about those that come to serve. There is something about those that make up their mind. They're going to be committed to the calling that is on their life and the purpose that they are in the earth. Pastor EJ told in the nine o'clock service he thought he was going to get here early. And he got here early and somebody was already here driving golf carts. You couldn't even see it was dark outside. That's where you understand there are people that are committed to the kingdom. They're people committed to the kingdom calling in the earth. And he said, I want you to understand the good works in you through this light will show forth. And he said, you're a city set up on a hill. And when we started this journey, I'm going to run through this very quickly. There were three words. If you've been here a while, you know these three words. They're on the wall of our uh, lobby. They're on all of our literature we send out. Three words that really are the filter of which we do ministry. How many of you know every church really has the same mission? It's to make the name of Jesus famous. It's really to make Jesus famous in the earth and spread the good news of the gospel. But how we do ministry is usually through culture or context. You know, my brother's in Lakeland, Florida. Pastors my dad's church. My dad pastored there for many years, and now he pastors that church. It's much different in Lakeland than it is in Tampa. Lakeland's got a different group of people. The town's a smaller town. It, it just the influences are different. And even just 25 miles away, it's much different than in Tampa. Uh, Matt and Raven, our, our new family pastor, they just moved here from San Francisco. How many of you know San Francisco is much different than Tampa, Florida? And they moved from Alabama. Can you imagine that? They left Alabama, got to San Francisco. I'm sure it was like shock. Just the food alone. Anybody like Southern cooking? I do. You can tell. So I have to get a large sweatshirt. Boy, you have to understand this culture is different, context is different. And how we walk out the mission that's been given to the church is always different because it's done through culture and context. And we believe that these three words were our assignment in how to deliver the good news of the kingdom. Three words are stamped on everything we do. But I've never felt more compelled to get back to the things that we grounded this ministry in and make sure that they were the fabric of who we are in this season. The first word is the word reach. Somebody say reach. We believe the gospel can reach to the lowest valley or the highest mountain. It can reach to those that are broken and busted, or it can reach to those that feel like they're up and in and have everything, but they do not know Jesus. And the good thing is we've got a little bit of everything. We got people that make it every day. We've got people that just make it through life. We got people that play ball for the bucks. We got people, we got all walks of life. And when you realize the good news of the kingdom is it leaves nobody out. Everybody that is willing to allow the good news of the kingdom in, it will reach them. But not only are we called to reach, we believe we're called to restore. We're called to pick up the broken pieces of life. The good news is we will never go out of business because there is always going to be hurting humanity that needs the gospel of Jesus. We will never run out of clients because there's always hurting people. We're called to restore. But then we feel like we're called to release. We're called to release people into their purpose, into their destiny, into the assignment that is on their life because everyone in this room is here on purpose for purpose. There's a reason you're here. You didn't just show up. You didn't just arrive on planet earth. You didn't just get dropped in Tampa, Florida. You may not want to be in Tampa, Florida, but you're here for a reason. There's a purpose in it. And we're here to help you find that purpose. And we felt like that if we would walk in this assignment in this lane. And then God began to give us some principles to live by. I'm going to hit those real quick and then I'm going to move right on. First, first core value and principle that we live by here at City Life. And these aren't personal. These are principles. When we walk in these, I'm not dealing with you or staff or anybody else. In a personal manner, we're dealing by principles. The first is unity. Somebody say unity. Unity. Psalm 133 says where God finds unity there, he commands the blessing. He targets people that are unified, unified in faith, unified with each other. Matter of fact, I tell people all the time, if you're looking for a drama ministry, this is not the church. I've got a whole list of churches in this city. 
And we will be glad for you to start one. Now, we don't want you to start one there. But we're not going to do drama. We're, we're going to love Jesus and love each other. We're, we're going to agree to disagree. We're going to get along with one another. We're not going to fight with one another. I grew up in church. I've seen too many church people fight over things they should be able to get over. Why? Because Jesus lives in them and Jesus lives in you. And we should be able to get over all this stuff. Even if we do not see eye to eye, we're going to walk in harmony and grace. Unity is a core value. Honor is a core value. We want you to feel honored from the parking lot or people that stand on this platform, guests that come in this room. We are going to honor. Why? Because you are created in the image of God and God loved you so much he created you in his image so therefore we're going to honor you and we're going to respect you honor is a core value here at City Life diversity is a core value here at City Life over 50 nationalities make up City Life Church we don't have to write a Facebook post about it we live it out every week we don't have to throw it on Twitter or Instagram we live it out every week we don't have to make a post because something happens long before anything ever happened in the media every week City Live lives out diversity. We are the kingdom of God in action. And this is the finest hour we have to be an example in the earth what the true church of the living God looks like. Red, yellow, black, or white. They are all precious in it. Come on, thinking that you're in a diverse church. Do you understand that this is one of the most segregated times in America, Sunday mornings? This doesn't happen everywhere. Diversity is a core value. Excellence is a core value. We're going to do the best with what we've got. Passion is a core value. We're going to sing hard. We're going to preach hard. We're going to run hard. We're going to pursue the things of God with passion because passion is like fuel. If you don't believe in your assignment, no one else will. If you don't believe in the gifts of your life, nobody else will. So we're going to run with passion. Atmosphere is a core value. You know, I thought about atmosphere, and I remember I, I, we went to Disney World one time, and it was one of those days I didn't want to go to Disney World. Anybody ever went to Disney World on a hot day? Well, this was a Monday, and I'd already preached four times the day before, and I did not want to go to Disney World, but my girls were out of school, and they wanted to go to Disney World. So we packed up in the car, drove an hour and a half, we got to Disney World, and everybody in Florida was at Disney World on this day. It was like everybody. It was like nobody stayed home. It was, I mean, we parked like nine miles away and we walked to a tram and we were sweaty and it was hot and I was not really feeling it. And, you know, Casey and the girls were happy and I was grumpy. And uh, we got to Disney World. We parked like nine miles away. Then we walked to get on a tram with 9,000 other sweaty people to ride, to stand in lines for hours to get on rides. But something happened. I got out of the, I got out of the car and before long, I heard music playing, and these music were coming out of rocks. And they had speakers in these rocks. And it wasn't just any music, it was Disney music. It was happy music. It was small world music. And it wasn't long, I started feeling happy. It wasn't long, I was excited to get on that tram. It wasn't long, we were getting pictures with Minnie and Mickey and buying balloons, our girls were little, and we were excited. Why? Because Disney knows about atmosphere. I came home, I said, Pastor Mike, I need you to find me these singing rocks. They have speakers in them, because I don't know what kind of hell somebody walked through this week. I don't know what they've been battling this week. I want them to get out of the car. You get out of the car at City Light now, we got happy music, we got worship music, we got praise music, why? Atmosphere. Atmosphere is everything. And when you understand you have the right atmosphere in your life and in your house, it changes everything. It invites the presence of God. It changes your attitude. Relationship is a core value here at Sea We're going to have a good vertical relationship with God and we're going to have good horizontal relationship with each other. Faithfulness is a core value here at Sea We're just going to be faithful to the calling. Creativity is a core value here at City Life. We're going to be creative with the gospel. We're going to package it well. We're going to share the good news in context with our culture. Generosity is a core value here at Sea You are one of the most generous groups of people I have ever seen. Right in the midst of a pandemic, we had five ACs go out at our other campus in one week. We did not expect it. I got up and shared it, and we're just a few dollars short of paying for all those ACs in a matter of a few weeks. You are generous people. But how do we reach a city? How do we reach people in a hurting time? How do we grab hold of hurting humanity? Because we have to reach them before we ever restore them. How do we become light to darkness? This is how Jesus told us in John chapter 8. 
And then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Here's what he's saying. I'm the light of the world. And if this light is in you, you're going to invade darkness. Here's what the church is real good at. We're good at standing on the sideline and cursing the darkness when we're called to be the light. We're good at standing way far away and cursing those things that we think are wrong or out of alignment with Scripture. We were never curbed to called to curse darkness. We were always called to be light. We were never called to be voices of distraction, but we were called to be voices of unity. We were never called to stand from afar and just curse the darkness, but we are called to be light. How do we become light? How do we carry Jesus out of the box of this room and leave and make an imprint on a city and become the fabric of a city, become the fabric of the kingdom in the marketplace, or become the kingdom fabric in our school or in our homes or our neighborhood? It's by taking the light and allowing the light to invade the darkness of your life and begin to shine out of you. It's by allowing the wind of the Holy Spirit to begin to go blow on that G-O that Jesus talked about in the New Testament where he said, go into all the world, but you cannot go without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's about it taking this anointing we have as believers and allowing it to be deposited not only in our life, but in the fabric of our everyday journey because the reality is this. We light up when we come to this room. We light up when we get to church on Sunday morning but for some of us we've had to reevaluate we've had to sit at home and worship we've had to worship outside of this box we call a sanctuary and we've had to determine is the light of Jesus still shining for but I've got good news I'm seeing it flicker over here and I'm seeing it flicker over there and in this dark season where the world is being torn apart I believe the church is rising up in its finest hour and we are declaring a good news that declares that Jesus is still alive the word of God is still true and the light has never went out. We're not going to hide it under a bushel, but we're going to put it high up on a lampstand. We're going to declare it on Facebook. We're going to declare it on Instagram. We're going to declare it on Twitter. We're going to stand up in the marketplace and not even have to say anything because we're going to see you going through hell and battling the enemy. But you get up every day and you put one foot in front of the other and you walk out the plan and the purpose of God and you fight the good fight of faith and you lift the banner of the kingdom and you are a testimony come on if you love Jesus put your hands together and give him a declaration of praise how by allowing the Holy Spirit to saturate I believe we are at a season where God wants to unleash a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit he wants to unleash revival now when I grew up revival was just four services in a week and if it was a real good revival it was seven days straight Anybody remember those type of services where they just went long and, I mean, we, you know, I remember growing up in church and most of the time I fell asleep on the pew and if you're new to church, you say, what is a pew? It was this long bench and I fell asleep and sometimes I got carried home. One time my parents, they got in, you know, they, they had this big service and they left me. One thought I was going home with them. My dad's a pastor and my mom always played the piano at church. And my mom thought she, my dad had got me and my dad thought my mom had got me. They got home, they began to talk about the service and they left me sleeping on the pew. <laughs> After about two years of counseling. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm, hey, I'm telling you, I'm churchy. I was raised in church. But revival was this set services. But really, that's really not true revival. Those are just gathering points where we stoke the things of God in us. Revival is when you leave this room and you carry Jesus home. Revival is when calamity has hit your house and you don't have the answer, but there is a peace in you that reigns and rules. Revival is when you get up tomorrow and you go to the marketplace and there is something about you that allows you to walk in integrity when no one else is. Revival is what causes you to get up when everything is pressing you, but a song is still rising within you. Revival is what allows you to sing at a midnight hour like Paul and Silas when you're locked down and you've been beaten up and there is nobody singing with you, but all of a song at a midnight, something rises deep within you and it comes from somewhere you did not even know existed and I believe that's what's happening in this season. There is something happening and it is rising out of believers and there is a season of revival and we are standing at this doorway but it's not for the weak need or the faint of heart. It's for those that take the lampstand and declare the light of Jesus is shining bright and we are the city. We're not a separated group. We're not a people hiding over here in the bunker but we are 
are the people of God and we are going to invade because we have the answer to poverty. We have the answer to human trafficking. We have the answer to brokenness. We have the answer to the racial issues plaguing our society. We are the kingdom of God and the word of God is in us. But this is what takes place. We make these moments and we take hold of them or we let them pass. You know, I thought about Daniel this week, and the Bible shows us in the book of Daniel. Daniel is not just a great historic book, but I believe really a handbook for spiritual warfare. It just interlocks with the book of Revelation. And in this book, we find this young man named Daniel. He's in a foreign land. He's in a captive state. And the pressure and the political heaviness of the day would demand things of Daniel that were not right and did not align with his journey of faith. And the Bible said that Daniel, after feeling all this pressure, not just in the atmosphere of society, but personally, he made a choice. He would stand. He would stand and he would just believe that God in this season would work. Daniel began to pray. For 21 days, Daniel prayed and Daniel fasted. The Bible said in this 21 days, the heavens begin to shift. In this 21 days, the heavens begin to open. In this 21 days, angels were dispatched. In this 21 days, principalities started to fall. But in this season and in this journey, Daniel did not always have it easy. It felt like things were just stacking up. You ever had one of those weeks where just like everything that could go wrong did go wrong? Daniel was in that season. That would happen a few weeks ago. ACs were going out. The lift station went out. And it was just, as I told you last week, every time Pastor Mike called, it was like we had to spend money. I just started answering the phone like, how much? I told you I changed his ringtone to money, money, money. That's what, what his, his ringtone is now. And it just felt like, it. on top of all that, I get a call at 3.30 in the morning and somebody, a young group of kids were flying down Del Mabry and they drove through our rental property out here, 120 miles an hour, just the hand of God, they did not kill themselves and drove right through our property that we rent out to this jewelry store. It was like everything. It was just all one week. It was a crazy week. And it felt like things were just stacking. Daniel was in that season where it felt like nothing could go right. Nothing could get any better. Friends were turning on him. The pressure of the day was mounting. One season, Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. Remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Threw Daniel in. That was for two purposes. Lions would viciously, viciously kill those thrown in. It would be very, a very horrible death. They, they put Christians in the Colosseum and they would unleash lions on them. And then it was also so that they could watch and that person being torn apart by the lions would be sport for the adversary enemy. They'd watch, it'd be entertainment. So when they threw Daniel in, not only were they expecting him to be torn apart, they were going to watch it happen and laugh at his stance that he had taken. But the Bible says when they threw Daniel in, Daniel got cozy in the lion's den. God shut the mouth of the lions. They became like little kitties to Daniel. You know, he just laid down and rested right. Here's what happens. When, when the enemy thinks he is going to destroy you, if you will begin to react the right way and respond the right way, God always turns those moments around for your good and begins to use them in the arsenal of the kingdom for you. Daniel came out the other side of the lion's den. And I love what Daniel 6 verse 3 says. Then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps. He had an excellent spirit. It was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Now watch what happened. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den, but Daniel just kept walking it excellent. Daniel just kept praying. Daniel just kept standing. Daniel just kept fasting. Daniel just kept worshiping. Daniel just kept praying. Daniel just kept trusting. And before long, things begin to turn. And those things that were against him begin to lift him. And that same king that gave the order to destroy Daniel began to promote Daniel. There's someone in here right now that the things that tried to destroy you in the last season are getting ready to propel you in the next season. The things that tried to bring demise in your life. Why? Because we're in a season where we become 
grounded in what God has said about us, this is what happens. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, it says this, but the people who know, who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. This is what I believe is happening in this season here at City Life Church, and we're gonna close. We're gonna believe that God in this season of chaos and craziness, in this season where it's hard to put your finger on it and figure it out, where, where maybe the job you thought you had is now gone, but now you've got another job, or maybe it didn't work out like you thought, or maybe about the time you thought you were gonna go back to work or go back to school, things got canceled, or just Maybe somebody in your family got this dreaded virus and it turned everything upside down. Or just maybe your faith has been shaken. Or maybe there's a fear and anxiety that is heavy over you. We're believing that in this season, the believer is rising up in the light that is in them. Is beginning to invade the darkness. Let's stand this morning. I want to pray with you. I'm going to ask the team to come. How do we reach a city? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And if this light is in you, your city set upon a hill, shining so that all the good works in you may glorify the Father. We're going to have some cool conversations on Wednesday night or the next few Wednesday nights. We're going to talk about some of the things that we're called to shine light upon. We're going to talk about poverty. We're going to talk about out of poverty, human trafficking and drug addiction and all of these things spiral. We're going to talk about racism and how we're called to be healing and to bear our brothers' and sisters' burdens. We're going to talk about good news of the kingdom. Jesus said, I'm here to take care of all these things. But sometimes we forget the mission. I heard a story. And it was a pastor of a large Baptist church in Indiana. And this church had a massive, massive bus ministry to the inner city. But the church was really a complex mechanism because the church was filled with very wealthy people. But they had this big bus outreach to the inner city. And every week, thousands of buses would come to this church. And there was one group of kids, because of the growth of this bus ministry, that had to come right through the sanctuary to get to their class. And it was a big Sunday. The place was packed, and somebody said, such and such bus is late today. Well, this bus had been late routinely, and the pastor was getting frustrated with the bus driver. And he knew that all of those bus kids... Some of them were not dressed well and had dirty faces. Would have to march through the sanctuary of this big, beautiful church. Past all of the people that were sitting in this service. And he said, the pastor really loved those kids to get there early so they didn't have to march through and disturb the sanctuary. But this Sunday, the place was packed. It was a special day. And the bus was late. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Finally, the pastor said, I'm out in the lobby looking for the bus, knowing those kids are going to have to tramp through service. And he said, the bus driver pulls in. He said, the bus driver opens the door, gets off, let the kids out. He said, I was upset. He said, I walked out and I began to berate the bus driver. I said, you're late. I told you, you need to be here early so all these kids can get to their class. And the bus driver began to apologize. He said, I was getting angry. He said, these kids began to file off. And he said, this little girl, she began to tug on my coat. Said I had a white cream suit on that day, not white jeans. But he said he had a cream colored suit on that day. And she began to tug on me and I said, I'm talking right now. And I just kept berating this bus driver for being late. Finally, this little girl said, are, are you Jesus? He said, I looked down and said, what are you talking about? And then he said, I looked at her. She had egg on her face and her dress was there. And she had no socks on with her. I said, who dressed you? Look, at you've got stuff all over your face. Your, your clothes are dirty. You don't have any socks on. Did not somebody dress you for church? She said, I'm sorry. I, I dressed myself. The bus driver came in and helped me because I was running late. But he said this week when he knocked on the door at my house to invite me that if I would come to this church, 
I could meet Jesus. And, and when I saw you, you looked so beautiful in that suit. I just knew you had to be Jesus. He said, it broke my heart in a minute. I forgot all of the things that were going on around me. I forgot the late bus. I forgot the rich people sitting in the sanctuary. He said, I picked up this little girl. He said, no, I'm not Jesus, but we will find her together. And he said, I walked down to the aisle of my big church. He said, we knelt there in the altar. And he said, once again, I rediscovered Jesus. I, during this quarantine, it was like the Holy Spirit said, Tony, make sure the main thing is the main thing. Make sure you have not got so busy doing all all this stuff, building buildings and building campuses and putting up lights and doing all this stuff. But the main thing is Jesus. And if Jesus is the light, it will invade the darkness every time. If Jesus is in us, we are not confounded to a box. That's why we can shut the doors and turn on the video camera because the light's not in this room. It's in you and it's in you and it's in you and it's in you and it's in you. And, in you. and it gets up and goes to work tomorrow and it goes to school tomorrow and it goes to our home tomorrow and it invades every place we walk in life we're going to worship for a moment and then we're going to pray and we're just going to believe that that light is getting ready to burn like never before I'm praying that City Life Church, coming out of this season, we reach more hurting people than ever before. I'm praying the good news of the kingdom is shouted louder than ever before. I'm praying that a roar rises up within you when you get up in the morning and it declares this is the day that the Lord hath made. So let's rejoice and be glad in it. I pray that when everything is going wrong, you raise up with a declaration. This is greater is he that is in me. The light of the world is in me greater than the forces around me. It's all about Jesus. We are the city. So when you go into the city, take the light. Quit complaining, take the light. Quit throwing out posts on Facebook, take the light. Quit just throwing jabs from afar, take the light. Quit arguing with one another over stupid stuff that in, in the realm of attorney will never matter. Be the light. Be the light of the kingdom. Be the light of the gospel. Let us worship. Come awaken your people. Come awaken this city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out. Come on, sing, this is your prayer.
to pray. We're going to pray. Then it starts right here. Sometimes we're good at praying for everyone else. But just take these right here, your hands. Lay them right here. We're going to pray that it starts right here. Father, I pray today that revival would begin. Renewal would begin. There'd be a fresh wind, Father. Father, I pray that it begins in me. Father, I pray that the light begins to burn in me. I pray, Father, that you saturate me and my family. Let me be a light in the marketplace. Let me be a light at school. Let me be a light in our neighborhood and in our home. Father, let me carry the kingdom message into dark places and in the corridor of hurting humanity. Father, I pray today, Father, that as we leave this room, as we disconnect from church online, I pray that we would have a stirring and we would know that the assignment is to carry Jesus into the earth. And Father, I pray that a wind would begin to blow. I pray there would be an outpouring of your spirit not just in this room, but in every home and every life. Father, I pray that this season would be a catalyst for revival. Father, I pray that every need would be met. Every life would be changed. Come on, I just speak over your neighbor today. Father, I just declare over them today. I declare blessing. I declare favor. I declare that their best season is their next season. I declare, Father, that every crooked place is being made straight and every broken place is being restored. Father, I, I declare they've been set up. Their home is a target. Their family is a target. A blessing. In Jesus' name. Thank you again for joining us for today's broadcast. Our prayer is that it ministered to you and it changed your life. If there's anything we can pray with you about or God has used this ministry to touch you in any way, please send us an email to info at citylifechurch.cc. We want to invite you to be our guest at one of our Sunday or Wednesday worship experiences. And you can find our times and locations on our website at citylifechurch.cc. You can also download our City Life Church app on your smartphones or tablets for more online messages. It was great having you with us today and we'll see you next time.